So we have a couple of more attendees just joining now, um, but we'll probably make a start. Um, and then just uh, a note that we're recording this session uh, and we will be having our presenters, but there'll be an opportunity for anyone to post questions in the Q&A or via the chat. And indeed, if you want to pose your question in person, we'll be able to accommodate that a little later. Um, so my name is Alastair Ager. I'm director of the Research Unit on Health in Situations of Fragility. And we're delighted to be convening this symposium reflecting on strands of our activity over the last four years. Uh, and we've been looking in subsequent successive sessions at the issues around fragility and its understanding, uh, particularly then focusing on mental health and NCDs. Uh, conditions that we've been particularly concerned with and their um, prevention and treatment in context of fragility. And now we come to our final session, which is reflecting on something which when we began uh, planning our work, we would never have anticipated, which was uh, service delivery and, and, and response in the context of COVID-19. So I'm, I'm really pleased to in a moment to be introducing uh, our presenters. Uh, who represent the, the partnership that we've been taking forward over these last four years uh, from ourselves at Queen Margaret University here in Edinburgh. I'm speaking from, uh, from colleagues at the University of Beirut, particularly the Global Health Institute there in Lebanon, and also the College of Medicine and Allied Health Sciences, COMAS in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, and it's been a privilege over the last four years to be working with these partner institutions and others uh, in deepening our understanding of response uh, to uh, the challenges of fragility in delivery of high priority health services. Uh, so I think that's the groundwork laid. Uh, just in terms of format, we have three presentations uh, which will run for around uh, 10 minutes or so, a little over each. Uh, and at the end of each of those, if there's any questions for immediate clarification, uh, very much uh, happy to have things flagged either in through the Q&A or the chat function. Uh, and then after those three presentations, we'll have around half an hour for general discussion, obviously following up on any individual issues about any of the papers, but also reflecting on themes addressed across the three. So I think without more ado, can we have the, the next slide? Thank you. And I'm really uh, pleased uh, to introduce Dina Mukhadin uh, from the Global uh, Health Institute of uh, American University, Beirut. And delighted to have been working with Dina over the last uh, couple of years in promoting uh, work in a number of areas. And as I just hinted at, we would not, not have anticipated um, two years ago uh, looking at the impact of pandemic disease, but clearly it's been appropriate with us within the program while we've been focusing on mental health and while we were focusing on non-communicable disease to be aware of the impact of COVID-19 and we are appreciative of the National Institute for Health Research in very much encouraging us to follow the needs and follow the issues that have been raised by the pandemic. Uh, so now I'm going to hand over to, to Dina who will be sharing with us around community and health worker experiences in the context of Lebanon. Dina. Hello everyone, thank you Alistair for the introduction. Uh, so I will be presenting the uh, project I've been working on uh, with colleagues from AUB and uh, QMU, Community and Health Worker Experiences During COVID-19 in a Fragile Context in Lebanon. So I'm presenting the work of me and my colleagues, uh, Aya and uh, Dr. Shadi Saleh. Uh, also very thankful for colleagues from QMU, especially Karen, Stella, uh, Julia, and uh, Eric for always being there and uh, helping on this project. Next slide, please. So as we all know, COVID-19 pandemic has uh, shaped every aspect of our lives, uh, whether through its direct effects on the uh, health of the community members, populations, and uh, the healthcare workers, 
or through the indirect effects, which were the uh, result of the uh, implications, uh, uh, sorry, the implementation of public health measures, such as the uh, curfew, the lockdowns, the social distancing measures, and uh, suspension of uh, international travel, all of which affected um, uh, several aspects uh, of our lives. Speaking of the fragility, uh, fragility setting, particular, uh, as we all know, the health systems in fragile settings uh, always struggle in, in normal or ordinary uh, cases, whereas in the situations of chronic stress, this is particularly exacerbated and enhanced, where they will struggle to uh, sustain the delivery of uh, routine services in addition to delivering the emergency services. The COVID-19 has particularly affected uh, the healthcare systems uh, globally, and uh, we, I believe the, uh, the the biggest effect was on the healthcare workers who were the first line soldiers uh, working uh, in the COVID response, who were obliged to work long hours uh, under pressure and in often with resources, especially in uh, LMICs and in uh, fragile settings. Uh, to speak about Lebanon uh, in the context of fragility a little bit, so uh, particularly the Lebanese healthcare system has been uh, suffering for many years, given the uh, the continuous uh, political uh, uh, political conflict and uh, insecurity, and this has been particularly exacerbated since the uh, economic crisis that hit Lebanon in October 2019, and which is still uh, in effect till now. Uh, other than the healthcare system, the food security in Lebanon was also uh, uh, very affected by the economic crisis, and then this was exacerbated by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, already 10% of the Lebanese household were food insecure. And this percentage is likely to be higher and more severe among vulnerable populations as a result of the effects of the pandemic uh, on food supply disruptions and the lack of economic uh, in, of income due to the loss of uh, livelihoods. Next slide, please. In this context, we were interested in uh, studying the uh, 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 to understand the uh, current lived experiences of co both community members and healthcare workers uh, who were active at the primary healthcare level, uh, level in Lebanon in two contrasting uh, economic and fragility settings and to, to characterize how the measures introduced to manage COVID-19 affected the experiences of healthcare workers and communities. Next slide, please. So we used a mixed method approach, which, which consisted of a qualitative arm and quantitative arm. Uh, the qualitative arm included uh, key informant interviews, which were conducted with the health officials working at the Ministry of Public Health, uh, active at, uh, in the COVID response uh, for non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and uh, working at the primary healthcare centers. Uh, the second qualitative component was the photo voice component, which was um, which was a key element in the application that we used for data collection, uh, where the participants were asked to upload photos and uh, voice notes of their experiences during the lockdown, uh, during the pandemic. The quantitative arm uh, consisted of cross-sectional and repeat surveys, which, was, which were also part of the application that was used for data collection. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, the majority of our participants uh, were from the Bika area. Uh, the percentage of uh, community uh, of community members was uh, higher than that for uh, of healthcare workers in Bika, whereas in Beirut uh, the case was the opposite. Seventy eight percent of the participants were Lebanese, whereas twenty two percent were uh, Syrian refugees, and uh, sixty eight percent were females, compared to thirty two percent being males. Next slide, please. So first we looked at the food insecurity uh, among healthcare workers and uh, community members. Uh, our results show that food insecurity predominated the rural areas in Lebanon, particularly Bika, with the community members being more insecure than uh, the healthcare workers. Next slide, please. 
We also um, measured the mental and physical well-being of uh, com both community members and uh, healthcare workers. Our results showed that 61% of healthcare workers reported uh, suffering from moderate anxiety, whereas 16% reported suffering from extreme anxiety. Uh, as for the pain, uh, healthcare, 44% of healthcare workers reported suffering from moderate pain, whereas 11% reported uh, suffering from severe pain. 82% of healthcare workers uh, reported no restrictions in daily, uh, in daily activity, and 79% had no issues with uh, mobility. Whereas for the community members, 48%, uh, the percentages were higher, uh, where 48% reported uh, suffering from moderate anxiety. And um, regarding the issues with mobility, 68% reported no issues with mobility, and 70% reported having no restrictions in uh, daily activity. Next slide, please. We also asked uh, we also asked the participants about uh, their beliefs uh, regarding the COVID nineteen measures and uh, how how much uh, to which extent they believe that uh, their their actions affect the, the the chance of them contacting COVID nineteen or passing it to their family. The highest the score was for uh, believing that COVID nineteen is a significant threat to the personal health of the participant or to their community, whereas the lowest score was was uh, for participants believing that they had any uh, little to no control on whether they contact COVID nineteen or not. Next slide, please. Next, next, we wanted to, uh, to explore the, the platforms that were most frequently used to receive the COVID-19 updates. Uh, the most common platforms reported were uh, social media and websites uh, with, with very minimal uh, reporting of using radio or newspaper uh, for receiving the COVID-19 updates. And um, the sources most commonly used were health professionals, uh, which are doctors or the head officials that uh, uh, represented the Ministry of Public Health. And the second uh, platform most commonly used uh, was the uh, family or news from family or friends. Next slide, please. And finally, we wanted to, uh, uh, to ask about the uh, measures that were perceived by uh, participants as necessary to practice to protect them from the transmission of COVID-19. Uh, practicing uh, good hygiene was the most common uh, measure reported, whereas uh, wearing face masks and or face coverings was, uh, was the second. And the, the minority of uh, participants perceived practicing self-isolation as, uh, as necessary to protect them from COVID-19 transmission. Next slide, please. So um, as a conclusion, uh, our results showed that food insecurity predominates uh, in BK, with community members being more insecure than health workers. Poor mental health the well-being in both health workers and community members prevails during the COVID-19 period, where both are subject to similar profiles of stress and depression, but this was particularly uh, lower among uh, community members compared to healthcare workers. Social media was the most commonly used platform by health providers and community members to receive the COVID-19 updates. Health professionals were the main source of information used by health workers and community members, and and remarkably, uh, protective measures to keep oneself from COVID-19 transmission were exclusively more practiced by community members when compared to uh, healthcare workers. Thank you very much, Dina. Thank, thank you for keeping so well to time and uh, thank you for uh, an excellent summary of the work. I just, we're gonna move very much from one presentation to another, but just to say, two things that jumped out to me in terms of past history or parallel work. One was um, our initial work, as I was explaining yesterday, in the area of fragility um, was based upon, and it clearly links with, an understanding of resilience. And, and, and clearly, in, a, in addressing situations of fragility, we are always interested in understanding mechanisms of resilience. And just that data that you showed of, of a high proportion of people reporting high levels of, of pain or distress 
but very low restrictions on activity, that sense of that there is the pain, there is the, the burden there associated with uh, the conditions and the st multiple stresses in the context in which you're dealing. Um, but people very much uh, powering on in many cases with, with uh, activities to support their, their livelihoods and well-being. And then we are also, as some people will be familiar, working as well as in, in Lebanon and Sierra Leone, our major focus countries, but another of, number of other contexts that we've been engaging, including El Salvador. And in Salvador, a recent study uh, by our group was looking at means of uh, social mobilization in the context of COVID-19. And again, that finding about the real uh, centrality of social media as a way of information sharing, even within rural communities as well as, well as urban ones. So thank you, Dina, for that. Um, I want to move on now to our second presentation, uh, building uh, upon this reflections in our core settings of the impact of, of COVID. And I'm going to pass on to uh, Hadja Wuri, um, who is our uh, honoured collaborator from Commas, uh, to talk to us about systems uh, compared to community perceptions in the face of the pandemic. Thank you, Hadja. Over to you. Thank you, Alistair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be sharing um, the experiences from Sierra Leone um, with regards to um, how the health system and also the community's perspective in the face of the, the ongoing COVID um, pandemic in Sierra Leone. And I'm going to be presenting on behalf of the working group um, for both the NCDs and the mental health um, groups in Sierra Leone and also at Queen Margaret University. So um, it's a lot of um, individuals who have worked on this and I'm presenting on their behalf. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to quickly go through the how the, the rough project has evolved in Sierra Leone. So phase one, um, we um, it was the scoping um, um, phase where we reviewed policies and relevant documents on NCDs and mental health in Sierra Leone to identify key policy interventions, um, initiatives, sorry, and then we looked at interventions aimed at responding to increasing trends for both NCDs and mental health. We also engage with policymakers at, at national level and district level um, within the health sector and conducted interviews with them both in, in two districts, so in Freetown, the capital city of Sierra Leone, and also McKinney, another district in, 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 in Sierra Leone. And then we also engage with the communities using group model building exercises in, in Freetown and McKinney to explore community knowledge pathways and um, care seeking for both NCDs and, and, and mental health. So we could get um, insights into the health systems perspective and also from the community perspective. And these outputs are available online, the scoping study for both um, mental health, psychosocial support, and also NCDs can be found on, 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 on the project website. Next slide, please. And the, the importance of, of the, the scoping assessment was that it helped us to identify what the research gaps were. And then what we, do, we did in phase two was to engage with the relevant stakeholders at national and um, at district level. So we presented the findings from phase one from the scoping exercise and um, discussed with them what were the, the emerging gaps that were coming out. And um, at the same time, we had reflections, suggestions, from the, the stakeholders, including the Ministry of Health, other key stakeholders, both within NCDs and, and mental health. And that was to ensure that there was synergy and non-duplication of interventions and um, research that other groups might be undertaking. And also, um, it also helped us to pinpoint what are the research ideas that we would take forward as part of the ROP project, bearing in mind that it has to address the interface between the health system and the community, which is what the ROF project is set out to, to achieve, and also has to throw some light on issues of fragility, um, where the research um, 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 ideas is feasible within the lifetime of the project, and um, where substantial interventions were required, were there suitable partnerships already on the ground that we could collaborate with, and that was the case for one of the projects. And also we had to ensure that we build upon the international evidence base, and also 
ensure that innovation um, in terms of the methodology, methodological approach um, um, was desirable and to, uh, to promote um, cross-cutting findings with our colleagues in Lebanon, we had to um, also explore synergies with the research that was being done in, in Lebanon. Next slide, please. And um, so a number of projects where, where were agreed upon um, concertedly with, with the stakeholders at national district, at, at district level. And so in terms of health system strengthening interventions in, in phase two for, for, for NCDs, we embarked upon providing support for the primary health care. Um, so providing a desk guide for NCDs to help identify, diagnose and treat NCDs. So this was prepared um, by reviewing existing guidelines from, the, from WHO systematic reviews and other relevant literature. We worked with um, uh, the NCD technical working group at the Ministry of Health and other relevant stakeholders that we had identified, including VSO, partners in health, and most importantly, the health workers um, in the districts that we were going to be working with. In, in. So this was piloted in, in, in Bombali district, which is where Makini is, and we used the training of trainers approach, wherein we identified um, CHOs, so community health workers who are at the forefront of delivering care at the primary health care level. And we train them, and that would ensure that the 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 the, the work itself it's it's sustainable. And we provided supportive supervision, and then they were tasked with passing on, um, cascading that that message on to other CHWs, not just within McKinney but also at the national level, because it came to attention that they had um, platforms that they used to communicate with with, with each other, um, so WhatsApp groups that they could share. Um, resources and 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 um, provided by the rough project so it could be shared nationwide to other CHWs. And then another project we embarked upon um, to support the health system strengthening um, agenda in Sierra Leone for NCDs was social mobilization. For those of you who joined the session yesterday, our colleagues um, Peter and Kieran shared the findings from that. So this was designed, the project itself was designed to promote community ownership and leadership again through the sustainability lens and then we also ensure that we worked with the social mobilization officer at the district health management team in Bombali to ensure that um, the national um, um, lens is also incorporated in, into that project. Next slide, please. And then COVID um, 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 struck. So March of last year, we had the first case of COVID in Sierra Leone. So we had to position ourselves to respond, to be responsive to the outbreak and support the, 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 the response at, at the national and district level. So for NCDs, we embarked upon providing desk guides for primary healthcare. So still working with primary healthcare because we had um, we, we had a footing in there. Um, so providing primary healthcare um, desk guides to help them identify care and prevent um, COVID in Sierra Leone. Um, it also defined the care delivery and management um, support tasks for three dimensions of the COVID response at the primary healthcare facilities. So this in includes care advice for um, COVID patients, their contacts, families and com immediate community safety, ensuring that health workers um, are protected. Um, so IPC, and if they're protected in turn, that the general patient population is also protected and also engagement with the respective communities. So that was key. The tool was piloted again through the training of trainers approach using CHOs already within the primary healthcare system. And then we also conducted key informant interviews with the relevant stakeholders to get their perception as well. And um, at the end, we triangulated the data. And what you can see there as a picture is some of the modules that was included in that training of trainers. So the training that was given to the CHWs to complement the, 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 the primary healthcare desk guides that were designed to help them to work safely and effectively in, in the face of COVID. And this um, was shared again um, using their um, paper copies were given, copies were, were left to the district health management team and electronically it could be accessed as well by a platform that was created and um, the, the, the PDF files were also shared. And again, the CHOs were free to share these with their colleagues, not just in Bombali, but also nationwide. Next slide, please. 
And um, so we then went on to evaluate um, um, the impact of, of the COVID guide. So some of the key findings that, that came up was um, around, for example, the uptake of the guide. So this was complemented by other desk guides that, that, that were being put forward by the MOHS and also WHO. But then it, as the, 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 the rough guide um, complemented what was being done so that the message there was the same and then there were some aspects that we provided that was not necessarily within the, the, the MOHS guide and also the WHO guide and then their experiences of using the desk guide so it was captured in the evaluation study that the, the guide that we provided was the first to train CHWs on COVID-19 management in Bombali district. So if you bear, take into consideration the Ebola outbreak, how important it is to ensure that the primary healthcare um, level is adequately supported to respond to shock. So be it COVID, be it Ebola, it is very important that we were able to identify that and provide that support to that level. It was also well received. Um, it was described as being comprehensive and systematic, provided systematic procedures for detecting, diagnosing and managing COVID cases, um, and also to protect themselves with, the, with, the, with a strong emphasis on, on infection prevention and control. It also empowered the CHWs, and as I said before, promoted um, IPC, so improved patient awareness of protection and social distancing. And then it's, there's a quote that, that was captured there where our nurse, our nurses were not infected in any department because they were using the guide. We have not had any nurse that was sick and ended up used and being tested positive for COVID. It also improved and supported the prevention and control systems that, was, that, that were in place provided by the health system regarding triaging, for example. So knowing how to isolate so suspected cases and so on and so forth, but at the same time ensuring that there's continuity of care. It also improved providers' um, knowledge and awareness and also confidence, because if, if they have the resources, they have the knowledge, and they, they are more confident to, to, to work um, as frontliners during COVID. And that's captured um, in the quotes there where it's saying that now they all have um, confidence and it's been attributed to the, the rough guides. Next slide, please. And then, as I've mentioned um, um, briefly, the, the guide also encouraged the continuation of routine services, which is very important because the, the system has to respond to the outbreak, but the, the, at the same time, it has to ensure that all the health services continue. Um, so we don't want to go back to um, a place where service users are not accessing health services because of fear or, or lack of knowledge about what was happening. So, Initial concerns existed um, in the beginning, for example, with TB patients. Um, so they have symptoms that overlap with COVID. So initially, they were afraid um, to go to health facilities because they had this conception that they would be misdiagnosed as having um, COVID and, and quarantine at the health facility. Um, but then that was quickly addressed as the, 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 the outbreak evolved. And then routine clinical services for tuberculosis, um, mal malnutrition services, NCDs continued after going through that initial fair period. And then oh, equally importantly, immunization services also continued and um, so what was done um, from the health system perspective was that before before COVID outbreak it was every, every it was weekly that immunization services were being offered but then they became very mindful that that would create overcrowding so that was done to daily to minimize the traffic of people coming in and also um, ensure that social distancing is, is adhered to uh, and so on and then also what was captured was knowledge sharing, as I've said before, CHOs were able to share the resources, not just among CHW, CHOs working in the district or at the national level, as, as I've said before, but also health workers working at the community level, so midwives, other nurses working um, at the primary healthcare level, so state and rural community health nurses, so the knowledge was disseminated widely amongst the, the, the health workers itself. But then there's some contextual factors um, to also be mindful of that could influence the results. So in terms of governance and collaboration, the DHMT, so the district health management team at the district level, um, through the, the district level COVID response team, ensure that different, different partners that were working together um, 
where we're working together to ensure um, coordination, collaboration on identified issues, issues that they have identified um, concertedly. So it was to, to minimize duplication of efforts and also bringing everybody to, 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 to the same page. And then there were some system level challenges as well. So um, from the facility level, lack of screening, lack of testing, um, and facilities, particularly at, at the start of the outbreak, identification of cases, and also collectively, this all fed into a lack of sense of COVID being um, an urgent issue from the service side. So a lot of work had to be done to, to dispel, because it was more or less the, 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 the fair at the beginning went down, which was good, but then it also had the effect that people might not want to adhere to safety measures being put in place because the fair was not there anymore. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps for, for NCDs and how we supported the COVID response, so the, the, the death guides, so the, the COVID response and also the, the, the wider health system strengthening agenda, as I mentioned before, before COVID, we provided death guides for the primary health care. So that has been adopted um, by the, the by the by the uh, Ministry of Health for, for national use. So what we piloted in Bombali has been adopted um, by by the Ministry of Health. Also the the desk guides that we prepare we we developed um, during the COVID to prepare primary healthcare facilities to identify can and prevent COVID. Again has been. Um, adopted by the MOHS and all of these resources are available on the MOHS website to support national um, optique and the link is, is, is given there and also all the training resources that went into the training of trainers for the CHOs who were implementing these interventions. Next slide please. And then for the mental health um, side, we had to be responsive for the mental health side as well. So we designed a project to explore stresses at community and, and health system level. So very similar to um, what Dina spoke about for, um, in, in Lebanon, and it was designed to explore the experience of healthcare workers and community members in relation to COVID to identify measures, in, measures introduced in Sierra Leone to mitigate the transmission of COVID, including the effects on these measure, of these measures on, on primary health care delivery. We um, also um, spoke with um, stakeholders at primary health care levels and at the national response to so key informant interviews for them to give us their insights on how the response was ensured, was, was organized to ensure continu continuum of care and then we uh, conducted surveys with communities and health workers that we had identified in both urban and rural locations to provide insights into stresses and coping strategies, their health and well-being, um, how they, the, the optic and comprehension of public health messages, and most importantly, their trust in the healthcare system. And this was complemented by um, photo voice data. So in Sierra Leone, we, that was what we embarked upon, but then in the course of, of, of implementing this project, some context specific issues um, came up, for example, um, access to data, because um, this remote surveys had to be accessed using um, um, technology platforms. So we relied on the communities and the health workers having uh, mobile phones or tablets that had enough space and so on and so forth. They had, we provided data for them to, to connect but then we had some challenges, but we had to quickly meet as a team to mitigate these challenges moving forward. Next slide, please. So the key findings coming out, so decision um, from, from the core voices study, so the exploring stresses at the community level. Um, so decision-making happens predominantly at the national command center level. So this was from the interviews we conduct, um, conducted with the, those at the national level and the district level with regards to the response. So um, pillar leads feedback what's happening across the districts and provide advice or recommendations. The governmental um, pillar leads um, um, keeps decision making and determines when and what decision or policy is being translated into action. So it, it was very much centralized. Um, another finding that came out, um, diverse pillars coordinates the response but power again largely centered at the, at, the, at the central level rather at the district level. Um, there was also ex execution of operations. So the military was um, called upon by the government to lead the COVID response. So that created some um, unintended tension between the, the MOHS and, and the military because the MOHS saw them, they should have been um, 
leading the execution, leading the response. And then coordination of supplies and communication. So that was handled largely by the logistics and social mobilization pillar. Advisory roles were again um, handled largely by technical pillars offering medical advice. So the Ministry of Health was incorporated into the response, but not um, as a, 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 in the leadership role. So local actors played a critical role in accommodating and swiftly setting up command centers during COVID-19. So example, providing spaces and resources and providing accommodation for ongoing command center directions. There was strong, strong recognition of the importance of social mobilization across pillars and some shared responsibility for community education across pillars. Um, though likely to be um, a one-way street um, in terms of decision-making social mobilization because of decisions being made at the top. And then response infrastructure, human resource capacity and processes um, formed, um, provide an opportunity to learn and sustain and improve preparedness for future stressors. Next slide, please. So here we're just going to share some of the photos that came out from the photo voice data. So you could see um, a young child there um, wearing um, facial masks. So everyone wants Corona to come to an end. Everybody wants to see the end of Corona. So this young child was um, attending church service with, with his mother, but then the awareness was there that they had to, he had to be protected as well. And then there's the picture in the middle where it's talking about how you isolate, well, it's depicting isolation and staying at home how tedious that was. Um, and again, that's been documented elsewhere, but then this is relying on, on nature to provide solace. And then from the health workers perspective is them seeing that they're all part of the team in the fight. So very much seeing themselves at the forefront in the fight against this, 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 this outbreak and then emphasizing their, their role in the outbreak, but also having faith. So there's a, there's a very strong emphasis on having faith in the face of disease outbreaks in Sierra Leone, be it Ebola, be it COVID. Next slide, please. So in terms of recommendations coming out, um, and I think this cuts across the board, engagement with relevant stakeholders, it's, it's very important. And I must say continued engagement um, is, is very important. National ownership, and, and leadership is very important, as well as community ownership and leadership. It's very important that you co-create with the communities, work with the relevant structures, the community level. Um, so be the religious leaders, the tribal leaders, the, the, the gender groups, the, the vulnerable groups, and co-create interventions with them, because that would impact on sustainability. And this was that, something that came out from the social mobilization work that was um, talked about yesterday. In terms of the wider health system strengthening agenda, um, um, in, in terms of um, the wider health system strengthening agenda, community needs should that should be should be aligned with the wider health system strengthening agenda, and um, it's been documented that there's strained or ruptured relationships between the two, and this has direct implications on health. So that should be addressed. Why, um, health system strengthening initiatives should try to marry the two, and then also provision of mental health and psychosocial support should always be part of the dialogue. It should, it should not be an afterthought. It's something that should be um, um, part of the dialogue. And uh, from the session this morning, it came out quite clearly that it's very important that we have these types of, of, of communication, these types of dialogue to ensure that it's seen at the forefront and, and not as, as, a, as an afterthought. Thank you. I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thanks ever so much, Hadja. That's a wonderful tour of, of well, nearly four years of really important research uh, I think, and for those that were in the symposium yesterday, you'll see just that in that on that final slide. I just comments about those um, strained relationships between the the health system and, and, the, and the state provision and communities as being a recurrent theme in our understanding of fragility and the importance of, of bridging that that divide or, or, or creating partnership there. Um, we're going to move on fairly promptly, but I just wanted to reflect on three things and at the same time as encouraging uh, our participants to post any comments in the chat, uh, which there are a few, particularly from, from Sophie and colleagues, but, but please add, feel, add to that. Or any particular questions you want to ask the panellists, we'll be coming to that in about another 20 minutes or, or so after our, our final uh, presentation. I, the three things I wanted to highlight, one was I was really appreciative of of, of Hadja 
highlighting the embeddedness of her work and that of colleagues over the last four years. There's an embeddedness in terms of the style of working uh, with the Ministry of Health and that close alignment with Ministry of Health agendas, which has enabled the sort of partnership and the sort of uptake uh, of, of findings and implications you know, so much more readily. But also that embeddedness allowed this COVID pivot to be embedded within the work on mental health and NCD. This was not a new project, just looking at COVID, it was able to leverage the relationships and the tools. Uh, and I think that's a real hallmark of your work, Hadjar and your colleagues at Commerce and, and, and others. So I wanted to really appreciate that. I smiled ironically, I don't know how many people in the UK have been following Dominic Cummins' ev evidence today to uh, a select committee about UK COVID response but this tension between central uh, governance and district local engagement is, is very pertinent in, in the UK. And that phrase that we that it's a bit of a one way street in terms of communication if the two come together. Uh, and it, it again reinforces this notion that, that whilst we might look at a context like Sierra Leone and see it as particularly fragile, some of the challenges that it has in this case, responding to the pandemic and working out how yes to have a clear national plan but to use information and insight from a skilled personnel, knowledgeable personnel at the district level is often a challenge for much uh, richer nations and, and with those with more some established governance procedures. So it's been a challenge for the UK and obviously a challenge there for uh, Sierra Leone. And finally, just thank you for those images from the photo voice. I think they are very evocative and it's a great power into the hands of health workers and community members to be able to document images that reflect uh, their experience. Um, so Maya, thank you for your comment in the chat. We'll come back to that in, in a moment. I'm just going to move over now to our final presentation, uh, which is from Zena Jamal. Zena first knew as a colleague at American University Beirut, uh, are working with us on a program uh, linked to health systems resilience, particularly of the services of UNRWA responding to the Syria crisis. And we'd be delighted to be hosting Zaina for her doctoral studies uh, over the last uh, three years. And Zaina is going to present on some parallel work uh, to the work in uh, Lebanon and um, uh, Sierra Leone uh, linked to a particular project in Gaza and also in Lebanon. So Zaina, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alistair. Uh, and thank you so much for the, for the introduction. So again, my name is Zaina Jamal. I'm a PhD candidate and a research assistant on the project that I'm going to be presenting today, uh, which is on resilient responses in fragile situations, an example of UNRWA's response to service delivery in Gaza and Lebanon. And today I will be uh, presenting on behalf of my uh, colleagues from Queen Margaret University, uh, Karen Diakonou, Julia Lefrida, uh, Sophie Witter and uh, other colleagues uh, from the from UNRWA, uh, uh, Dr. Sita Akihiro, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Shada El Beg, uh, Mrs. Uh, um, Masako from the UNRWA headquarters, and from Gaza and Lebanon uh, UNRWA field offices, Dr. Suha Smail and Dr. Zuhair Al Khatib. Next slide, please. So uh, quickly, I will go over the rationale and just, just give some background information about, uh, about the study. I will uh, go over the methods that were uh, utilized in this research, and I will uh, share some main results as the analysis for the, uh, for the following research is still uh, ongoing. Next slide, please. So as I said, this, uh, this research is uh, uh, basically is, it's, it's an UNRWA uh, case study uh, uh, that aims to appraise the effectiveness, equity, acceptability, and scalability of strategies that were uh, put in place by the health systems in the context of the global COVID-19 pandemic to sustain routine service delivery and mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. Now, example strategies to be investigated and already rolled out by UNRWA include the introduction, for example, of telemedicine services in Gaza, the longer dispensation of prescription medicine for chronically ill patients in Lebanon. Uh, other strategies that are, uh, that are debated include recommendations for social distancing in refugee camps, for instance, and the establishment of isolation centers. Next slide, please. So in this, uh, so this, this case study basically is a mixed method uh, uh, study design. 
uh, utilize a mixed studies, a mixed method study design, uh, whereby we have used five different tools for data collection. So first of all, we conducted interviews with professionals at the headquarter, field, area, and clinical uh, level, and those uh, staff specifically that are involved in the uh, coordination of the COVID-19 response and the delivery of routine health and social care services. We have also conducted interviews with community leaders and members. Uh, we have uh, also collected some survey information using a BESPOC web application with uh, 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 healthcare and um, and uh, and social workers over a period of over a period of, of two weeks uh, and over a period of one week with community members. Uh, uh, the information that was uh, collected uh, during uh, the, the survey, for example, they related to household stressors, related to their uh, individual well-being using the WHO, uh, WHO uh, five well-being score. Uh, also, participants were asked about their, their trust in the, uh, um, in the health services provided by, uh, by UNRWA, and staff were also asked about their, their perception on uh, uh, primary care services during the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, uh, uh, the, the survey uh, included a, a photo, voice, uh, photo voice components as well. Um, now, in addition to all these, we monitored in both settings uh, the, and analyzed the changes in routine indicators on COVID-19 and essential services, specifically maternal and child care services and NCD services. And finally, using system dynamics analysis, uh, we, we utilized this to explore the effectiveness of strategies that are employed by UNRWA. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so the following, uh, uh, the following research was conducted on protractedly displaced communities that are living in, in crowded conditions. Uh, and uh, uh, Gaza and Lebanon were specifically chosen because they are characterized by a similar population uh, profile. Uh, uh, as in both, uh, in both countries, refugees predominantly live in, in highly populated settlements. Uh, but there seems, to there seems to be some contrasting contextual features, for example, uh, relating to the dual crisis in, in Lebanon. Uh, which adds to the uh, COVID-19 crisis. So, so in Lebanon, uh, as, you, as you might be uh, familiar uh, to the current situation, there is an, an ongoing uh, economic, uh, economic crisis which adds to uh, the stressors of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So these two uh, concurrent case studies were conducted, uh, as I said, across Lebanon and Gaza over a period of six months. Uh, starting June 15, 2020. Uh, the um, uh, settings have been chosen purposefully to reflect contrasting contextual conditions, noting, for example, the different responses for COVID-19 that were enacted in Gaza versus Lebanon. Uh, for example, that includes UNRWA's use of diverse measures across fields, including the introduction of telemedicine, for example, in Gaza, the establishment of isolation centers in Lebanon, um, and uh, the, the case studies, they encompass the UNRWA's health system in each, in each setting, do, drawing on routine health systems data from January to September 2020. And community level data collection was restricted to settlements with the largest concentration of displaced uh, Palestinians in each setting. So for example, in Gaza, we have chosen the two highly populated camps, specifically Rafah and Jabalia camps. And in Lebanon, we did the, the same thing by choosing uh, the two camps, Ain al-Hilwe and Burj al-Barajne. Next slide, please. Uh, now, the, the following uh, graph uh, just it summarizes the number of cases that were identified among Palestinian refugees in, in each of the five different fields of operation of, uh, of UNRWA. And these numbers are updated up to, March, uh, up to March 15. And as you can see, the highest number of COVID cases uh, were basically found in, in the West Bank and, uh, and Gaza. And the, the transmission of COVID-19 has accelerated uh, pretty, pretty fast. Uh, during the, the uh, summer months around July and, and August of, uh, of 2020, which that basically came after the, the acceleration of transmission rates in Europe. 
Next slide, please. So the, the following are just, um, just main points that were identified from the, uh, the context uh, mapping. And there are certain, certain differences uh, between, uh, between two fields. So for instance, in, in Gaza, there was an introduction of uh, toll-free uh, call, uh, call number uh, for, uh, for giving out uh, uh, health consultations. Uh, there was a phone triage. Um, uh, uh, in both, in both, and and these these two things were not actually implemented in uh, in Lebanon. Uh, in both settings, lockdown was was imposed uh, repeatedly, uh, often with a very short uh, short notice and a quick uh, return to normal life after uh, after lockdown. Uh, in Lebanon, uh, UNRWA conducted some initial screening campaigns in camps, but however there wasn't any further reporting on these uh, screening campaigns um, uh, in Gaza that that did not happen at all there is no information about the owner conducting any screening in, uh, in in camps next slide please uh, now again uh, this is just an example of, of some of the findings that were found from uh, from the from the survey and as you can see these these graphs, basically, what they do is that they depict the first three measures that were encouraged by UNRWA, uh, that were acceptable by participants and practiced by them. And as you can see, the ladder shape uh, of, the, of the graph on the left uh, shows that the community members, for instance, they paid less attention to some of the measures compared to community staff, for instance, especially uh, the first, uh, the first two measures on top, which are specifically self isolation and social distancing, and it's worth mentioning that uh, in, in interviews, so interview data from community members showed that many they had concerns about uh, available uh, isolation centers. They weren't really happy uh, about it, and in many instances, they felt that it does not agree with the, with the social norms, especially when it comes to to female uh, patients. Also, uh, practicing social isolation was a bit challenging uh, for, uh, for community members, especially because, because they are living, as I said, in, in highly uh, populated settlements. Now, uh, the trend, however, uh, uh, amongst, amongst UNRWA staff shows that the measures encouraged, acceptable, and practiced are almost identical with two measures, uh, specifically wearing protective equipment and social isolation as the least uh, practice. And uh, again, it's worth mentioning that our uh, uh, information from, from interviews basically show that PPEs, for instance, were prioritized uh, to, to staff members that were in direct contact with potentially infected individuals. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the following depicts some uh, UNRWA's response to, to COVID-19. Uh, COVID uh, and, and these were uh, taken actually from interviews and from, uh, from context mapping. And, and as you can see, there are certain measures that are familiar to UNRWA because, because UNRWA was subjected to previous, uh, to previous shocks, such as, for instance, the Syria crisis, whereby they had to respond to the displacement of, of Palestine refugees into other fields of uh, operation. So examples of, of measures that were previously uh, enacted by UNRWA uh, are the, for instance, the introduction of uh, mental health and uh, psychosocial support services, uh, the creation of uh, emergency teams, even dispensing uh, um, uh, longer uh, or even longer dispensation of medications was also implemented in uh, during the, the Syria crisis. However, there are certain responses that are new and specific to this pandemic, such as, for instance, establishing isolation centers in Lebanon and uh, converting schools to medical points in Gaza. Next slide, please. Now, uh, drawing from the conceptual framework on uh, resilience of health systems, the following actions reflect uh, UNRWA's health system's ability to absorb, adapt, and transform when subjected to a shock. And in this case, it is the COVID pandemic. Uh, in general, 
Absorption reflects the system's ability to respond to population needs using available resources. An example of, of such responses would be uh, task shifting, for instance, that was carried out by, uh, by staff from various departments in, in UNRWA in order to assist in service delivery. And this was something, for instance, that was seen during the uh, distribution of, of food parcels. So different community, different staff from different uh, departments, basically they, uh, they helped each other in order to, um, uh, to dispense uh, food parcels in a timely manner and in a safe manner as well. Um, another example was uh, about uh, uh, absorptive uh, responses where, for instance, social workers providing psychosocial support for COVID patients. Now, other responses in, enacted by UNRWA reflected its ability to mix and utilize resources, uh, and that reflects the adaptive capacity of the UNRWA's uh, health system. Uh, responses such as creating a triage teams, introducing toll-free lines, adjusting the pickup and delivery of medications. All of these are responses that were enacted by UNRWA, but they are not, they are not meant to be uh, uh, permanent, uh, permanent changes. Uh, finally, uh, uh, UNRWA is, is currently questioning uh, to make changes in, in specific organizational processes, such as maintaining service delivery, for example, using the family health team approach, and uh, developing uh, new strategies for the distribution of cash assistance. And these responses reflect uh, UNRWA's ability to transform its structure and functioning and to respond to changes in the operating environment. Next slide, please. Uh, now, the following are uh, uh, themes that have emerged from uh, interview analysis. And there are six main themes, as you can see, that have emerged from uh, from interviews, uh, a theme related to emergency planning and learning, which I'm going to be discussing later on, the mobilization of resources, uh, 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 governance, uh, open governance and dedicated leadership. Uh, there was a theme around coordination and communication both within UNRWA and with outside organizations, uh, adaptation to service delivery, policy coordination between international agencies. And just because I have a limited time, I will just go over uh, uh, giving the yeah, examples about some of them. And but then later on, of course, um, I, I'm, I'm open to your uh, to your questions around any of these uh, themes. So just to give an example, next slide, please. Just to give an example uh, around uh, emergency planning and and learning, it's it's uh, uh, basically it's worth mentioning that. Uh, UNRWA was, was able to, or the UNRWA staff, they were able to learn from their previous experience in emergencies in general and adjust the emergency uh, plans that they normally operate with during an Israeli attack, for instance, to meet the current situation. So, uh, for instance, I have this quote from, the, from, a, uh, from an area office uh, staff in, in Gaza, and specifically he said, we in the Department of Health do have an emergency plan, but not designed for such a pandemic as COVID-19. They actually sent us at the beginning an emergency plan and we had a discussion around it and did some modifications. So basically the emergency plans that they have are mostly related to uh, mitigating some security kind of issues, but not to such pandemic. However, they were able to, to respond uh, uh, promptly and adjust the uh, emergency plans that they had, uh, that they had in place. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, now, regarding uh, regarding mobilization of uh, of funds, uh, donor countries uh, and mainly European countries were uh, were found to respond pretty quickly to to flash appeals uh, that uh, that was raised by uh, by UNRWA, and this is evident from the uh, uh, quote that uh, that is displayed uh, in front of you. And other funds, other sources of funds were, were also available from uh, WHO and, uh, and, and, other, uh, and other NGOs. And in, ge in general, uh, during this, this pandemic, there was some sort of an agreement uh, between uh, interviewees that, uh, um, uh, that resources were generally mobilized uh, promptly. Uh, there was a high level of uh, of 
cooperation and coordination between different departments, between different fields and, and the headquarters. So action was, was taken uh, relatively uh, very, very, very fast. Uh, there was uh, no shortages at any point in time, for instance, in, in PPEs. Um, uh, medication was, was dispensed promptly to, to patients, so uh, there was no um, interruption of treatment, for instance, for any of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, chronically ill patients, specifically NCD patients, and this was reported in both fields, in Gaza and, and in Lebanon. Next slide, please. Uh, now, in regards to governance and uh, leadership, the headquarter office was, uh, in general, he was was in charge in, uh, in uh, he was in charge of developing agency wide uh, corporate approach while delegating decision making to uh, field offices, giving them the operational responsibility to act in an effective way that suited the local context, while referring to the headquarters for advice when needed. So again, this uh, in this in the quote that you can see in front of you, it says, "Our field offices have the operational responsibility, and in in an emergency, you delegate decision making to the lowest level possible because that's that's where you just need to delegate it that way for an effective response." So Gaza Field, for example, was taking decisions on operations in school, whilst headquarters led by the head by the health de uh, department we were developing our own kind of agency wide corporate approach uh, to how we should uh, we should relate and and probably uh, in this this thing gave or allowed um, prompt responses basically uh, to take place uh, during uh, during during this uh, this uh, pandemic next slide please uh, now the following are just um, uh, some of the uh, of the photos that were shared by uh, by the participants and the photo voice component that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so, for instance, when when one participant was asked about how how does he or she maintain her well-being, her, uh, her well -being, uh, what she did was that she uploaded this this picture, and this is from a participant from uh, from Gaza, actually. Uh, a female participant, uh, and she said that when asked about how, how does she maintain her well-being, she said, I try every day to make use of a small window whereby I expose myself to sunlight in order to get some vitamin D during the morning, some fresh air in the early afternoon, and I wouldn't miss the beautiful sunset every day. So it's these uh, basically simple things um, that refugees uh, uh, resort to in order to maintain their, their, their well-being. Um, another participant uh, uploaded this, uh, this picture of, of a little boy who is holding a sign and just to, to, uh, to translate what, uh, what this sign is, is about, it says, we are still refugees it is your responsibility and your meaning UNRWA's responsibility to protect us and provide us with all the services. Um, so from this, uh, from this uh, uh, picture, or, or basically this picture resonates with um, interview data from community members saying that UNRWA is our lifeline, basically it resembles our lifeline uh, because we, we rely on UNRWA uh, on, on everything. Uh, so, um, so basically they are always asking more and more uh, of, uh, of UNRWA as their, 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 their life conditions are, the refugees' life conditions are, are pretty uh, difficult. Next slide, please. Now, in, in conclusion, uh, several elements mentioned before enabled resilience of the UNRWA health system, such as the presence of the culture of learning that fed into the emergency planning, as I said earlier, the ability to mobilize resources promptly, the communication and coordination uh, both within UNRWA and outside UNRWA, i.e. with organizations, other organizations and with the community, the open governance and dedicated leadership, and therefore uh, uh, delegating power to field staff and giving them operational responsibility to act. Now, it is worth uh, saying that amongst Palestinians, resilience is 
something that is culturally embedded. Personal and collective resilience amongst Palestinians as a sociopolitical concept has enabled Palestinians to survive in the context of occupation, for instance, during uh, chronic adversity, lack of resources and limited infrastructure. And it was evident by the staff response how culture has permeated into service delivery, therefore creating a collective responsibility towards sustaining services. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Saina, uh, for covering a lot of ground. And um, we are moving very shortly to throw open for general discussion. Just uh, a couple of things I wanted to highlight. I, I mentioned uh, in Hadja's work about the embeddedness and the linking of, of her work to the previous work. And again, I, I see Simon, Simon Pickard from Elra uh, is uh, uh, attending and, and really pleased for Elra's support from the earlier work with UNRWA uh, as well, uh, as well as this current study uh, looking at resilience. And, it's, uh, and as Sophie saw in the chat, the idea of building upon that framing of resilience, of absorption, adaption and transformation, it's really good to see that that thinking not only in our research, but it, it seems like in the thinking of under itself as it understands how to flex and build upon uh, other emergency plans and, uh, and adapt them for the for the current purpose. I, I'm sure like many other people, I, I was deeply struck by the challenges of um, COVID in the challenging environment, particularly of, of Gaza, thinking of the, just the difficulty of social distancing, the, you know, the, the physical challenges of actual social distancing. And as you were hinting at the, the triage or the um, sharing of PPE uh, to only the, with the most ex greatest exposure because of, of shortages in, in that way. So we're, thank you for highlighting those sorts of, of, of issues and that are having to be addressed by, by, by frontline staff. Um, I want to move now to general questions and discussion. We've got about 22 minutes for that. Um, and one of the, uh, there's, a, there's a question that I'm going to come to very shortly or, 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 or a comment uh, regarding um, gender issues, which I, which I think it would be good to, to follow up on. But I, but I particularly wanted to, Sophie, I might come to you either to pose it as a question or just as a reflection, because in the earlier presentations from Hadjah, you made an important point, Sophie, I think, about the extent to which the current, the response in Sierra Leone uh, to COVID echoed or, or had resonances with the Ebola response. Uh, and I, I felt when you first made that comment, so some negative things in terms of, OK, he hasn't learned things. But I think you were commenting, well, actually, there are some things that have been positively learned. And then there's also that echo in um, uh, Zena's presentation, obviously, about uh, UNRWA's response to other crises and how it's adapted those or used those. So, so Sophie, just thinking of the various re reflections and your own engagement in Sierra Leone, do, what do you think about organizations or, or states as learning from previous exposures? What, what, what's for you coming out of these presentations in terms of uh, either UNRWA as a learning organization, that phrase you use, or, or Sierra Leone as a state learning and having that path dependency or path informed approach to COVID based upon Ebola. Um, so. Sorry, just to, to say Sophie, I think has left us. No, I've just, <laughs> I've, I've just lost her. Okay, so, so, yes, <laughs> sorry, I was just going to flag that. Uh, Karen, do you want to jump in on any of that I, in linking to that because of, of what yeah. Sophie and Yes, no, and maybe I'll, I'll then hand over to Haja equally because I think she might have some remarks. Um, I'm just going to maybe reflect a couple of minutes, and I know Hannah actually Berian is is here from Liberia, from one of my colleagues. So I think what struck me, having done studies that are quite similar across different settings, the same learning capacity issues were coming up quite consistently. Um, I should say also in Liberia, for example, but equally with a different model. So I think whereas potentially Sierra Leone had tended more towards, okay, we require the military to respond to a crisis. I think in Liberia, actually, what impressed me was the health system was taking on more of a leadership role this time, I, I think. So equally, they had learned, but potentially in a different direction. Um, and just to compare that to some in initial thoughts or initial interviews that we were doing in the UK, there was some learning there among people who had, for example, responded or from other colleagues who had worked on UK-based work. Um, responses to small outbreaks of an infectious disease in a small community 
and them reflecting back, but not not being able to scale almost from that small response to a much bigger, let's say, you know, county level or district or, or so on. And in the UK it would be county, I'm guessing. Um, so that's that's been quite consistent, this idea that we had to look more at learning and equally at who facilitates learning and how that might actually have an effect on whether or not learning is taken up. I think in some of our Sierra Leone data, certainly some of the interviews I've seen, there are some people who consistently say, we were in the first response. This is why we're, we're telling you this. So that's been quite interesting. I don't know, Haja, if you want to come in as well. Thanks, um, Carrie. So, yes, so when COVID struck Sierra Leone, even before we had the first case, there was a lot of talk about um, in COVID in the um, into fighting the response. Some of it worked in hindsight. For example, um, even before we had it was very easy for us to um, re work um, hand washing stations. So, um, because that was something that was part of us during Ebola. So you'd go to, to offices, to banks, um, to schools, um, other learning institutions, and Sorry, we're losing quite a lot of you on, online, Hadja. So perhaps I'll come back to you again in a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. see if your line is cleared. Um, I think we're here. So that was quite easy for us to, to go back to as to have military lead the response. Okay, I'm sorry, Hadja, I'm going I'm to cut you off. Um, I, I think we're, ca we're catching about 50% of what you're saying, which I think is that there are some things that were learned and that were emulated, like hand washing, but other things that needed to be adjusted and, and so forth. I'll come back to you in a couple of minutes, Hadja, if, if, uh, if, if your line clears a little bit. Um, uh, Karen, did you say you had a colleague from Liberia who you might want to bring yes, in? Yes, so Hannah is on the call as well, but I'm equally aware uh, Zhao is equally on the call. So I, I don't know, Zhao, you had your hand up if you wanted to, to discuss, or Hannah, if you wanted to have any reflections on, for example, how Liberia handled the current COVID outbreak. I'm going to just enable you to talk if you want to, to say something. Anna, you need to unmute if you if you want to speak. Yeah, if you are speaking. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear you. Uh, can you try and unmute Joe as well, uh, Karen? Yes, yep, just both have permissions. Quickest. I think, Joe, if you had your hand up. So, yeah, just to share th this reflection on, on learning from Ebola for COVID for Sierra Leone. And Joe, you need to unmute as well if you... Okay, we're not having luck with our unmuting of, of, of people. Well, uh, I'll let you persevere with that, Karen. Um, and uh, what I wanted, I just wanted to flag Maya Abu. Uh, thank you for a, a question or a reflection regarding um, the very first presentation, but I think it's a more general one. So I'll, I'll come to you, Dina. It, it was really around gender differences in, in your findings of health workers. And it was hinted at, I think, in Zena's presentation also about and sorry, also, I think Hadja's about gender differences between expectations and so forth. But I'll come to you first of all, Dina. So I don't know if you can see the question, but the health workers are in Lebanon. Were there any gender differences in results between these health workers? So, Dina, do you want to reflect on that? I'm not having luck with the un. Uh, I know. Um, hold, I'm trying to get Dina. Are you able to hear us? So Maybe I'll. I'm. I'm happy to. Yes. So we you we comment we comment on that in, in, in that Karen. And if we're struggling, we we can either have quest, questions in the in the text in the chat or. or yes, or exactly. Um, so I think there were some. Oh, well, we now have two people with their hands up, equally Ibrahim having their having his hand up. Okay, um, so just to say, yes, we had looked at gender differences and indeed, I mean, we found minor, I think, gender differences. We didn't have a very large sample. Um, I think what will be interesting is the triangulation of data 
Um, so we're really trying to understand a little bit more. Certainly what we've seen is that women have a harder time in many cases because they're also managing other responsibilities. So again, that came out a little bit in terms of the stress stressor data, but then we would probably need to look at that more. But equally, Stella, you're on the call as well if you wanted to jump in on that. Do I bring Ibrahim in first? Um, um, if okay. he had his hand up, we'll come to you, Stella. Aha. Yeah, th thanks. Great thanks, hearing uh, your voice, Ibrahim. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Karen. I mean, I'm not sure if, if, if uh, I, um, I mean, I'm just wanted to share some some experiences from Lebanon in, in uh, tackling the 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 the, uh, the the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we did some some quick round of research to look at how Lebanon, from both a, a technical uh, perspective, meaning health system preparedness and governance perspective, and the public policy response tackle this pandemic and I would like to add to what colleague mentioned uh, colleagues mentioned about how countries learned from uh, from previous experiences that Lebanon as well learned from from how uh, the preparedness to to actually address uh, the previous pandemics including the SARS pandemic and so on and so forth and technically one of the lessons learned from the Lebanese experience is that actually uh, building capacity is the capacities especially within the public system helped a lot so in Lebanon the private sector had a, a high level of reluctance whether to join the battle if I may say uh, against uh, COVID-19 so the, the Minister of Health had already uh, within the major public hospital in Beirut, the Rafi Hariri hospitals, a unit to actually uh, be able to isolate people with COVID-19. And that helped us to gain. And uh, this is why the first period or the first part of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic response was successful in Lebanon before having a lot of later discrepancies, especially at the governance level. And that's why, I mean, we need to highlight that in addition to preparedness, meaning looking at the, the hardware of, uh, so, sorry, the softwares and what, what we have in terms of public health surveillance, human workforce capacity, we need to look at how countries address that from a governance perspective. So in Lebanon, we had a lot of, unfortunately, duplicates and committee cre creation, uh, uh, overlap between the, 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 the tasks and actually the mandates of those committees, which led actually to to losing trust from the community perspective and also to have uh, actually non-effective, if I may say, uh, public policies, and that was an issue. So just to sum this up, actually, I mean, we, we have a lot of things to, to learn from this pandemic to for the future pandemics, but we need to always keep this uh, uh, balance between what should be done from a technical perspective, preparedness, but also from a governance and how to mitigate those, those challenges in the future. Thank you so much, Ibrahim. That, that's really helpful. Um, two, two things, and I might bring you back in. I just wanted to see, first of all, if Dina wanted to add anything to that. In, if you can unmute yourself, Dina, or if you are available, just in terms of your original presentation, but in, in terms of this broader reflection on, on lessons learned from, from previous challenges or, or, or what we're drawing on. Um, but if you're, for any reason, you're not able to, uh, Dina, I wanted to come back to you, Ibrahim, and ask you a a question relates to what you were just saying about governance and, and that uh, it did seem me, particularly in Zena's presentation, where the narrative within UNRWA is very much about honouring the local and, and the, the lowest level of decision making possible and seeing that as important. Uh, and yet we know, as I was saying earlier, that significant debate in terms of identifying flows of information between central and local levels in terms of the COVID response. Do, do, do you have thoughts on that in terms of governance within Lebanon about what would be feasible and what would be appropriate in terms of COVID response? Uh, and obviously there, there were challenges in central coordination, but what units at a local level might be appropriate or how functional those local units are? Um, I, I just, I, I'm interested in your reflections on that in terms of the, the, the issues you raised around governance. I think, yeah, absolutely. We had, I mean, I would say we had a lot of, of problems of of, uh, uh, of uh, communication and not just communication, but also participation between people on the ground or even local uh, municipalities, local government and the central government. A lot of public policies that were adopted in Lebanon didn't actually uh, 
were not feasible. So we had this implementation gap because of the absence of local municipalities, let's say, on the decision table, because some of several, I mean, it was, it, I know it was a, for, for different countries, a way to try and learn from errors, but some things could have been avoided by just having a better participatory mechanism. So in Lebanon, a lot of policies were around, for example, when they, they, they once tried, the government tried to use a, a local lockdown approach. Some municipalities were not being able to implement uh, those uh, approaches because of the fact of interconnectedness between different areas and not having a clear vision from the central level of what's going on on the ground and how to define the boundaries. Just one example, and I don't want to go into details, but yes, we, we've seen such a discrepancy between uh, the vision of, of the government and the vision of, of people on the ground, uh, health providers on the ground even, and as well communities. And I, I, I stress on that because in Lebanon was a, a really interesting case study, uh, interesting case study on how trust in the government response changed a lot between the early uh, phases of the pandemic and later in the summer when we had an increase before of maybe because of some gaps in how to open up the airport and so on and so forth. So technically, and that's why I stress on this issue of governance because governance is much uh, more related in some participatory mechanisms to the buy-in and to, 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 to the uptake of those and the implementation of those policies on the ground. So that's I, I hope I addressed your, your comment, Alistair, but I'm happy yeah, to I think go on. That, That's helpful. And, and for anyone that's been attending all of the sessions of the symposium, this is the, the fourth of the four, uh, then that notion of trust, uh, both trust in, in institutions, but also trust by institutions in staff and, and trust of, with trust within communities has obviously been very pertinent, not just around COVID, it, but, it, but clearly is hugely relevant, um, but in other service provision in terms of NCD and, and, and mental health. Um, we're coming to the close of our time and obviously we've had a few connection difficulties in bringing in people for discussion. So I'm sorry if you wanted to speak and we've not somehow managed to uh, unmute you. Um, but what I wanted to do in closing was really just do a quick round uh, of our three presenters. I'm going to ask them each the same thing, which is that, you know, uh, 30, 40 people have, have tuned into this uh, session interested in COVID response, uh, possibly they maybe have an interest in, in, in Lebanon or in Sierra Leone, but they may have an interest elsewhere. If, if there's one learning from the context in which you've been working in uh, regarding uh, uh, COVID response and the role and perceptions of community members or our health workers, what would it be? What's the one standout thing uh, that you've learned or you think is particularly important from your context that others perhaps should consider. So I'm going to come to you, Dina, and, and if for anything you can't get your mic going, you could put it in the chat. I'll look out for you. But hopefully if, we, if you can unmute Dina, you could just reflect on what you think is the key, a key take home essentially from, from your work. Uh, and I can't see your uh, uh, microphone unmuting, so I imagine uh, you've disconnected for some reason. Uh, we'll try and get you back, but if, if not, can I move on to you, Hadja? So in terms of, of the COVID response in particular, what's the, what's you think is the key lesson, key learning coming out of this that you'd want to share with those in other contexts? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Yes, okay, thanks, Alistair. So for me, I think it's um, ensuring that the community voice is also um, included at the response level. So the very centralized, top-down heavy um, approaches should be reviewed um, and um, to ensure that the bottom-up approach as well is considered. So ensuring that the voice of the community um, is included in the response. And um, another thing I think that needs to be um, integral to that process is it has to be holistic it's it's very much one-sided looking at one aspect of, of the response but they're not looking at the the, the mental health and psychosocial um, side of things so it's not something that should come up as an afterthought it's something that should come up um, from the planning stage 
um, of the response and not something that, you know, because it's come up during the response, then measures are trying to be put in place to address it. It should be from the, the onset that mental health and psychosocial support in the face of a shock in a fragile setting, it should be of importance now. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Hadja. That's really helpful. Um, Zaina, can I come to you? What, what, what do you think comes out of your work in, in Gaza and Lebanon that would be of interest, of key interest to others? Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I would like to, to echo the same comment that Haja has just uh, mentioned when it comes to including the voices of the communities when uh, uh, formulating the, the response uh, strategy. So as I mentioned in, uh, in, in my presentation, and uh, I gave example, for instance, about the um, isolation centers, uh, which was a very good, a very good idea and a very good mitigation strategy uh, against, uh, you know, the uh, the overcrowded settlements that the Palestinian refugees are are living within in Gaza and and Lebanon. However, they were perceived by the community as uh, something that is uh, socially and culturally not not acceptable so uh, at the end of the day they were not utilized uh, uh, to their to their best capacity because uh, because uh, you know covid patients would would refuse basically to uh, to 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 go there and uh, and of course onrwa does not have the power to force people uh, to to use these uh, these isolation uh, centers um, uh, another uh, another uh, important message is that during such a, a pandemic, a prompt action is pretty much uh, is pretty much needed and is is crucial in order to uh, uh, contain the, the situation and to respond to people's uh, to people's immediate uh, immediate needs. Uh, and in, in um, at some point, uh, you know, the 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 response from from UNRWA was was prompt enough, but as uh, mentioned uh, by several community members, that their response was not complete. So, for instance, they would ask uh, the community members, for instance, to isolate at their at their home, but at the same time, they would not, you know, provide them with the means. To, to stay at home and still provide for uh, for for their families, so um, so it's it's these things probably that uh, that need to be <clears throat> worked on uh, if uh, another if if we were to face another uh, another pandemic or another uh, uh, breakout of uh, of cases. Thanks so much, Sena. And I think something that we've realised during the course of playing this whole symposium that these lessons from COVID and for COVID have much broader implications for other sorts of provision, just like Hadja was flagging in terms of understanding that mental health needs, for example. And, and so uh, we hope we hope we don't face other pandemic like this, but we hope that those lessons learned from it that apply to other uh, conditions, other concerns of communities. Um, thank you so much to the presenters uh, for leading us in a really important discussion and really appreciate the, the pivot that the, the work that you've been describing has involved over the last 18 months or so under very difficult conditions. Um, but I think illuminating something really vivid about the experience of communities and particularly of health workers in the context of, of, of uh, delivering services in a, a fragile environment during a pandemic. So really appreciate that. Thanks very much for uh, those attendees who joined us this afternoon. Uh, this session has been recorded and will go on the, the, uh, the research unit website uh, that, that was flagged earlier in the, in the chat, as will the uh, recordings of all four of the sessions of the symposium, which have been uh, documenting various strands of our work over the last four years. So a deep appreciation again, Hadja, to you and your colleagues at Comas, uh, Dina, to you and your colleagues at AUB, uh, we really appreciate uh, our partnership um, and our work together uh, and many other colleagues that we've been working with uh, over the last uh, few years. It's an important body of work which we think can make a big contribution and we continue to be engaged in the publication and dissemination and the policy uptake of all this work. So thank you presenters, thank you attendees uh, and please keep in touch with us and I wish you well for the rest of today. All the best, bye-bye.